We grew pot in our garden and smoked it. <laughs> I learned how to roll a joint in preschool. My mother thought it was cute and then we got to roll her joints for her and that was a lot of fun. We moved to Virginia and lived on a commune for a year, a sort of back to the land thing. And there were a lot of naked people around, but uh, they were... Uh... And I told my parents I didn't want to go to school, it wasn't fun anymore. And they said, okay. My first experience with tear gas was when I was two months old at a Black Panther rally. The hippies of the 60s and 70s created a social revolution that impacted everything from recycling to relationships, from tofu to what was considered taboo. They made the mark from the halls of justice to the Halloween costumes which you can buy for your kid, ironically at the local drugstore. Many hippies were weekend hippies who wore the costume and then went back to work on Mondays. But a few hippies totally changed their lives and dropped out of normal society altogether. And then some of those hippies had kids. These kids were not hippies like their parents. They did not decide to drop out. They were born dropped out. In 2008, six of these children of hippies, people now in their 30s and 40s, were tracked down as part of a thesis project and experimental documentary video. They were each asked to answer the same set of questions and then recorded themselves using a video camera. Health food really sucked. It's a lot of work. I'm not interested in getting up at 5 in the morning and grinding wheat like my dad did. To He was toasting like kasha and then grinding it and making homemade cereals. I would hide <laughs> my lunch. I would go with uh, rhubarb, maple syrup, yogurt um, to school, all of which we had grown or made. Probably one of the worst things about being a hippie was lunch. My dad was a lawyer and my mom was a flight attendant before they became hippies. My mom moved to San Francisco and my dad followed her because of love or something like that. When I was born, my father was 44 and my mother was 19. And the story that she tells is that um, when I was an infant, she was holding me in the rocking chair and watching the Ed Sullivan show and saw the Beatles and suddenly got a clue that there was something going on out there that she wanted to be a part of. And she knew at that moment that she was going to leave my father and go participate in uh, what was happening. I, I really know nothing about my actual birth father. Um, obviously, the main catalyst for my parents to, to drop out, to quit their jobs, and to, in, in their case, leave the United States was the Vietnam War. My dad got drafted, and it was, I think that it was a very simple choice for him to escape to Canada. I was the only kid around, really. Most of the people I was hanging out with were somewhere between 19 to 25 year old college students. I lived in a loft in what is now Tribeca with my mother and stepfather. The real hippiedom, I think, is later in my high school years, we moved to Virginia and lived on a commune for a year, a sort of back to the land thing that was really flawed <laughs> for me. Uh, the whole thing in New York worked really well, and moving to the country was not at all what I was up for as a young teen. My parents left the U.S. when my mom was pregnant, and they had nothing but a backpack, so they were very poor. My mom said that she gained 11 pounds during my pregnancy, so you can imagine they, they probably weren't eating almost anything. The kids ran around like crazy, and all the adults looked after them. Any adult that I encountered could you know, speak to me or, or, or rein me in or, or let me loose and, and that 
that was really, you know, there's a really strong community in a lot of ways. We moved all the time. We pretty much lived out of backpacks or the backs of trucks or something. We we were caretakers on other people's property, and we we had tents. I guess we lived in teepees in the in the summertime and uh, and other people's houses in the wintertime and stuff. My mom was a teacher. She'd been a school teacher for decades, you know, and um, I think she just realized that people learn at different paces and that I should just be able to take my time. And They would do things like take me to foreign films with subtitles, where I would sort of be, you know, subtly forced into reading to try to know what was going on. My parents read to me all the time. In the evenings, they'd read to me and, and things like Lord of the Rings or, you know, more grown-up books. And what they would just do would be read me these exciting, you know, science fiction books or fantasy and then they would maybe stop at like a really cliffhanger portion of the book and then I would sort of pick it up and, you know so that worked. When I did enter school I went into third grade in a small redneck town and that was mostly terrible. I did awful in public schools. Uh, the kids weren't nice to me at all. I was a really geeky weird kid and after a while my mother noticed and we, I guess she had a story of us, like, uh, she'd send us off to school and she'd come out a little while later, like an hour or two later, and we'd be sitting on the porch. And so finally she realized that it wasn't going to work and there was the opportunity to send us to a hippie school. My math tutor was a total hippie, more so than my parents probably. They had this theory that the kids would learn math when they were ready, and I guess I never was ready, and I preferred playing tag, so I played a lot of tag. The real world, I don't try, I think. I think I, I make my connection in uh, sort of rebel culture, counterculture communities. I don't fit in to the mainstream world. Um, I've tried. There's a lot of families at my daughter's school that talking to them is sort of like talk. it's apples and oranges. I can't, I have no, not, not, not the same reference points and when I do open my mouth, sometimes things come out that I realize that people are just kind of drawing a blank, a complete and utter blank. It can be very lonely. It's really frustrating. I guess I had this sense, and I still do, that that I'm a traveler from another place, and I'm not really from this world. And I am now, of course. I didn't do practical things with my education. And along the way, I would do whatever came along. I worked on a fishing boat, I've done construction, I've done tech theater, I've done bartending, I've done, and to what I do now, which is uh, computer stuff. For the last seven years, eight years of my life, I've only been an artist, and that's been pretty fantastic. I'm making lifestyle choices that I feel are, that have integrity and are thought out on my part, but also involve kind of dropping back into society in a certain way. I, I don't see that, I think there was an urge at that point to drop out of society, to remove oneself from just the, the, the bad stuff that was going on, and the heavy, heavy things. My parents must have instilled in me the belief that just because someone is an authority figure, a president, a police person, uh, a teacher, whatever, that they are not automatically right, that you should investigate what's going on and not automatically believe their story. I sort of uh, chafed under authority when I was in school. When a teacher came along, I didn't really like her somewhat authoritarian attitude. I left school. I don't know if that's the best way to go about things. A lot of times what they were asking me to do wasn't the best thing to do. It wasn't the most compassionate thing to do. And it often was really not an intelligent thing to do. And I really started to feel like authority 
represented unintelligence. <laughs> I definitely don't have an ingrained respect for authority, and it's great, but it also gets me in trouble. was high priestess at my dad's second wedding to my stepmom and that was a really beautiful day you know I mean my parents were very open to um, letting me be who I was they never shut down my strange interests like Wicca for example in fact they embraced it and said yeah why don't you be the high priestess you know and cast the circle and call everyone together and you know so I I did that <laughs> I don't think the bad was any one particular experience. I think the bad was that my parents were so much exploring and trying to figure out who they were that there wasn't that sense of um, an omnipotent parent. There was nothing to rely on in a certain sense. And so I was very much on my own steam, which in some ways was wonderful and in some ways really, really hard. And not having someone to depend on is difficult. And and I feel like there was, in some ways, I'm sure very liberating, a different idea of parenting, where the parents still got to be a person, not calling a parent mom or dad, but calling them by their first name and so on. But at the same time, you really need your parent to be the parent. And they were so self-involved. And, and I think that continues, actually. <laughs> There wasn't much. I had no structure growing up. There wasn't any discipline. I think I was spanked a couple times when I was little, but once we moved into the commune, I don't think I was supervised enough to be disciplined. I guess by pretty much any definition, I had a fairly structureless childhood, given that, you know, I was allowed to quit school. We pretty much did what we wanted. We weren't bad kids, but there was no boundaries, so there was no crossing boundaries, so it really didn't come up very often. I don't feel like I saw as much sex as um, the, the stereotype of that era would make you think. It was a great ideology for people that wanted to get laid a lot. My parents really didn't participate much in the free love part of the hippie movement that I know of. My dad probably would have liked to have uh, had a little bit more free love. The thing I remember most, I guess, in the sense of free love is that um, Everybody was naked all the time, and there was a sense of uh, the body is beautiful, no reason to hide it, we can all be together and be naked, and it's not a problem. I've explained what pot does to my kids. I mean, explained it to my kids that what pot does, it kind of makes you happy but stupid. But I remember um, wishing that my dad did smoke marijuana rather than alcohol. And um, for myself, I also didn't take drugs. Maybe maybe because of seeing my parents not do it, but but I do really like drinking. And um, again, I think that that's not a socialization issue. I think that that's a physical one. My mom claims to have only like tried pot once. Yeah, so I think my parents were really serious and engaged and, and really were trying to be part of something that would change the world. And it kind of fell apart for a lot of reasons. Violence, you know, again, the assassinations and the war, and I think took its toll. People were exhausted. The movement fractured, and people, there was a lot of infighting. And then I think a lot of it was this whole party mentality, and, and drugs, I think, took a huge toll. And I think my parents saw that. I was probably in seventh grade, and I skipped school to go wait in line at a Jefferson Starship concert with friends. And I had promised my parents that I wouldn't do that. 
but of course I did, and they found out, and they snatched me out of line and threw me in the van and took me home, and my punishment was they took away all of my pot-smoking paraphernalia, you know, my bomb, my stash, and everything, and they took my Van Halen tickets away. <laughs> I remember being one of those kids that toddled around concerts, and and my mother saying, you see, you see up there on the stage, if you get lost, you go up there, and the man will announce it, and I will come get you. It's difficult to function in mainstream society. Um, I don't have certain skills. I guess I've sort of retraced my parent, my parents' steps in reverse. So they moved from the city to the country, and I've kind of made my way back. In a commune, communication, that's been a huge issue for me. I mean, it's been very, very difficult because one of the things in a commune is it gives you a very unrealistic perspective of what people actually do in the world to communicate. Uh, in, in, at least in my household, we met once a week, and everybody talked about, you know, what people needed, where the boundaries were, how to accommodate so and so sleep schedule, how everybody was trying to work around everybody's needs and accommodate everyone, and that's really not what happens in the real world. I think it's just been so simplified now, and I think a lot of people don't want to deal with the realities of cultural upheaval and talk about the ramifications and what was really going on. I think there's a huge misunderstanding of what that era involved. I think that the term hippie is a, is a misunderstanding by definition, but it's also become the, the sort of iconic thing that, that it was destined to become in that in that sense of trying to sum up a zeitgeist with a word. So I think there's a lot of things from that era that we would like to, that, that are painted now as if they were superficial. It was about fashion, um, tie-dye, and drugs just to be out of it, and sex, crazy sex. I think in that that I'm sure it was part of it, but I think there was also something about really exploring consciousness and responsibility. Of course I would say no, but you know, it's like I meet people who say, you know, I was raised Catholic, but I'm not a Catholic, you know. I go to church every Sunday, but I'm not a Catholic. Or it's a part of my culture, but I'm not really Jewish. Um, so I guess I would answer the question in the same way, like, it's part of my culture, um, but I'm not a practicing hippie. I don't think I'm a hippie now. Yes, I would say I'm a hippie. I guess I was a hippie of my, you know, just because of the road my parents chose. When I was 15 or whatever, certainly people would say I was a hippie with long hair and they maybe still call me hippie. I have like earring. I don't know if that's a hippie thing. I don't know. I'm not a hippie and I've never been a hippie. Um, my parents will tell you that they were never hippies, but uh, people, other people would say that they were hippies. I want to say that I'm proud of my parents for sticking it out as long as they did. They really did put in a lot of hard work to live the lifestyle that they chose, whether that was a hippie lifestyle or whether you might call it something else entirely, I don't know.